OK, so we have our temperature inversion. Like I said, what, what you get from that is you do this process once you get back the temperature solution. There's really nothing more that you need to do. right? You, you need to go through and make sure that there's convergence and all that uh, and compare it to an analytic, analytical solution. But in terms of the actual solution process for inverting the matrix, you're done. But what happens in a case where, let's say you have some temperature dependent properties like you're going to have on your homework. You can't just invert a matrix once because it turns out that the temperature dependent properties uh, give it this uh, implicit nature. Right? You have the temperatures that you need to evaluate the properties, but the, the, those properties need to be evaluated to calculate the temperature. So it's this like circle. Um, so to deal with, the, with that specific situation, which is actually more common than you think it would be, um, we're going to go into gauss seidel iteration. All right. So let's see. Um, before we get to the temperature dependent properties, let's understand a little bit about what gauss seidel is trying to do. Uh, and then it'll become clear um, you know, why, why temperature dependent properties falls into that bucket. So here's the, uh, the method. So first, we're going to solve explicitly for uh, temperature at some node, right, Ti, where Ti is going to be all nodes. So we, what, what I'm saying here is let's come up with an explicit solution for Ti at the node, um, and, uh, symbolically. Second, we're going to guess the temperatures Ti. Right? We m might call that T hat I or something like that. Uh, and again, this is so why am I guessing the temperatures after solving explicitly for them? Well, I'm going to solve explicitly at basically as far as I can. But there's still going to be implicit relationships there. So I need to provide an initial guess for what I think is close. And then I'm going to use that. Right. So guess the temperatures for Ti. Step three is going to be compute uh, new temperatures using step one. Uh, and then four is check uh, error against tolerance. OK? Very vague, hard to understand what I'm saying. So let's go through an example. Uh, we'll just let's just do the node i because you can kind of figure out what's going on from that. So for if we take node i, step one solve explicitly for ti. Right? What does that mean? I guess I need to I want to solve explicitly for this guy here. Uh, everything else would be on the right hand side. Thinking about this from the perspective of a, a programming language or a computer program that's trying to run through, I'm trying to find some term that I can use to assign a value to ti explicitly. Okay, So solving this for ti, I guess, would yield something like uh, the following. We have ti is equal to, in the numerator, a bunch of stuff. That's rho e delta x over ac i squared plus Ti minus 1 times Kac over delta x plus Ti plus 1 times Kac over delta x. And in the denominator, I have what? Uh, 2Kac over delta, delta x. 2Kac over delta right? So this is going to be 4 i equals uh, 2 to n minus 1. All right, we would do the same thing for 1 and n, but I'm lazy, so let's not do that. All right, we have uh, now an explicit relationship. I can go through, let's say I knew everything over here. I can at least use that all to assign a value to ti. All right, and this is where that guess comes in. So I've solved explicitly here, but as I'm going through this process, Okay, I might, when I get to Ti, I probably have already a value for Ti minus 1. I definitely don't have a value for Ti plus 1. Right? I, don't, I'm not, I haven't gotten there yet. 
So what we need to do is guess initial temperatures. So at least I'm kind of close. Maybe I say it's 300 or 500 or whatever the, the, the case may be. Guess an initial temperature so I can at least evaluate this expression and get something out of it. Even though it's wrong, right, I'm getting something out of it. It turns out, though, if you do that, you guess, you recalculate the temperatures, update your guess, it will converge, right? This approach will converge to the right temperatures. It's kind of like magic, right? <laughs> you're going through, you just take a guess. It doesn't really matter. And you're going to get back something. And if you just keep doing it, it'll get better and better and better. And eventually, you'll get the right answer, right? So one of the things I, I'm still amazed at uh, when it comes to this stuff. All right, so again, we do the same thing here, same, same. We have our, our set of equations. The methodology is that you're going to go through, you have your set of equations, you, you're going to update, you calculate every single equation, and then you'll go back and compare the error of that calculation to the, uh, to the tolerance, and when that's done, you're done. Like when you, the error is less, then you're done. So hold on to that thought about the error. I'll show you how to actually compute that in a second, all right? So this is gauss seidel this is sort of a stepping stone, which is why I didn't have the right file there, but it's a stepping stone of what I want to talk about, which is the temperature-dependent properties. OK. So what we have in this equation are conductivity, what we have uh, electrical resistivity, like these things here, conductivity, <coughs> electrical resistivity. Um, I guess that might, might be it for this example, right? Conductivity, these, these things here. Those things could actually vary with temperature. Right? Like, we know that thermal conductivity varies with temperature. We also know that if a wire gets really hot, it's going to behave a little bit differently in terms of energy generation than if it's really cold, um, which is why people do conducting in cryogenic conditions, right? Um, because that, that is true. So what we want to do is come up with a way of handling those depending on temperature. Uh, but again, these are all multiplying temperature to begin with, so uh, it really complicates the, the process. So let's look at, at our um, initial uh, nodal discretization and do redo the energy balance now with the assumption that what I have uh, conductivity and resistivity that are functions of temperature. And I've just picked some random function just so that you can see uh, how it might play out. All right, so for this example, if we go through, let's take node one, uh, and we're looking at what, Q bottom. Um, Q top is going to be, I think, the same. But Q bottom, let's look at that one. So if I write out an expression for, for Q bottom, that is uh, Fourier's law. So it's K uh, times AC. So I'll leave a big gap here. So K times AC times T. 2 minus T1 divided by delta x. But K is now a function of temperature. Right? The question is, which temperature should I be using to evaluate that conductivity? Right? Is it T1, or is it something else? Right? I'll leave that open for now. But let's, let's leave that, that the way it is, and let's look at T, uh, the second node, because I think this is going to clarify it. So let's write the same, the same expression here. Now we're looking at Q top. This is Q dot bottom up here. This is now Q dot top. Again, we're going to have K something AC times T1 minus T2 divided by delta X. Right? And there's, there's other stuff out here, right? This is not the only thing. The point I want to make is if I evaluate um, conductivity at T1 or at node 1, and here I evaluate conductivity at node 2, these two things are exactly the same equation, just different by a minus sign. So if I have a different conductivity here than I have here, the Q dots don't match, potentially. Right? If your Q dots don't match, the problem's not going to converge. Because you're, you're saying my Q dot in both of those cases, which is represented by this term, it has to be the same. So I need to pick a common temperature that they both share, that, they can, uh, that their properties can be evaluated. 
Well, that would be what? That would be this interface between the two nodes. All right, so k, this is going to be t1 plus t2 over 2, t2 plus t1 over 2, right? It's the same thing. So now I've got exactly the same q dot flowing between nodes uh, because I'm evaluating. So it's really easy to forget that. Um, but always make sure that the energy terms that you have between your equations are consistent. Okay. Um, let's see, what else can we talk about? We've got, yeah, so let's look back at that example really quick just to, to wrap things up. All right, so for this example, um, this is showing how you actually uh, do the temperature dependent properties. Again, this is for the the matrix inversion approach, you can do this ex the same way for gauss seidel um, I will upload that example when I find it. But what you have is uh, now a temperature-dependent resistivity and a temperature-dependent conductivity. You would give those uh, function definitions, uh, give them the expression in terms of temperature, and now you're just passing in your temperature value. So down here, any place where we previously had just a constant k, now I replace that with this evaluation, right? this kf. Oops. I wouldn't do that. Um, so this is a function call, right? and you're passing as an argument the temperature that you're evaluating, the average temperature. So you could do that. I mean, you could do it once, maybe above that, and then reuse it in this part. Um, same thing here. But any place you see that kf, it's being replaced. Any place you see the resistivity, it's doing the same thing. Um, one, uh, one curiosity, though, is, OK, I've got T average here for the conductivity. I just have the node temperature for the generation. And why is that? Right, well, that's because the generation is only associated with that node. Right? There's no sharing of generation between nodes. Eventually, the heat flows out, but it, they don't have to agree. Like Two adjacent nodes don't have to agree on the generation in the adjacent nodes. So you can, you can get away with just using, or you should use just the node temperature for the, any generation specific stuff, right? So look at it, uh, energy flows that are crossing boundaries. Those have to have a common temperature. Um, energy flows that are just associated with a node, whether DUDT or G, those can be evaluated at the temperature of that node. Okay, so we go through, um, last thing here. So we go through, updated all our stuff, and then uh, here's the process that you're going to follow. So we left it off here before. Temperature is my uh, inverted matrix times B. Um, now I need to compute some error. So I have this temperature. I'm going to look at my new temperature minus my original guess, Tg. Take the, this is dot wise uh, square, and then find the maximum. And there's different ways to calculate the error, but this is just a way of saying how bad are, is my temperature at any position. Uh, the squared is to make sure it's always positive. So this is going to give you a positive error. I'm going to print that out. And then I'm going to look at um, whether or not that error uh, falls below the tolerance. If it does, then I'm done. If it doesn't, I will just keep looping. Uh, once you compute the error, then you go ahead and copy over your new t to your original guess. And then the guess is always used. Right? This guess is always the one that's being used throughout. Right? So there's a few things going on here, but just um, Kind of pay attention to the details. So if we run this, what you'll see, hopefully, here, yeah. So here is our original plot, and now we've updated our properties, and you can see that it's slightly different, right? And you can also see that it converged after 25 iterations. So, okay, um, that's all I had for today.